Chris, thanks very much for uh, for giving up some time today. Um, I wanted to ask you three questions, really. I wanted to just start with Ralph Stacey. Um, and I wondered if I could just ask you from, from your view, what do you feel he really brought to this field of complexity theory and complexity thinking? Well, Ralph was among the pioneers of thinking about complexity theory and its relevance for organizations. So he was really at the forefront in the late 80, 1980s and early 1990s of really struggling with the ideas to think about what they might mean in detail. And he was pro a prolific writer and um, made a big splash with the ideas, I think, and was invited serially to uh, Santa Fe Institute and other uh, conferences where people were really struggling with these ideas. And um, at the same time, he was also undergoing uh, therapy and became interested himself in group analytic practice. And it was the combination of the two struggling with what the complexity sciences might mean, teaching in the university, uh, engaging with all the leading lights of complexity theory in the 1990s that actually forged the Doctor of Management program, which started at the University of Hertfordshire at the end of the 90s and is still going strong now. Mm -hmm. So I know that Ralph feels that one of his greatest legacies is um, a rigorous academic program where people can take up these ideas and really struggle with them together in a community of inquiry on the doctorate mm. and can uh, get a doctorate on the basis of that. And many people have gone on to either to work in universities themselves or to become scholar practitioners. And I know that for Ralph, seeing his students accept mm. their doctorate on the stage at the St. Albans Cathedral was mm. the thing that mo meant most to him. Yeah, no, that's great. The, the, I, I was also thinking um, about many, many people remember Ralph in particular for his development of complex responsive processes. Mm. And I can remember him, it would have been in the 1990s, insisting vehemently that there is no such thing as a system. And I, yeah. I completely understand where he was coming from. But could you just say a little bit about complex responsive processes? OK. For anybody who's come across uh, Ralph's work, that there is a clear break in his work at the end of the 1990s, uh, partly when he met up with Patricia Shaw and Doug Griffin, where he moved from perhaps a more uh, instrumental use of the complexity sciences and descriptions of organisations as complex adaptive systems to thinking about organisations to be like complex adaptive systems. So it was a clear turn away from um, uh, using uh, perhaps a more instrumental approach to the complexity sciences and a turn to the social sciences, mm. where some of the same ideas have been taken up by, well, we would say Norbert Elias, the pragmatist mm. philosophical tradition, um, group analytic theory, which is also working with the idea of complexity and uncertainty when groups of people get together to do mm -hmm. things. And actually, if you, you see Ralph's work quoted very often, there are those working in more of a realist tradition who will only quote Ralph up to about 1998 before mm -hmm. he developed the idea of complex uh, responsive processes. Mm -hmm. And the term complex responsive processes itself is a deliberate move to get away from complex adaptive systems. So human mm. beings are not just adaptive, mm. we're responsive, mm. we're adaptive and responsive, if you yeah. like. Yeah. Mm. So it was the idea of um, human processes which are radically unpredictable mm. and cause the pattern of stable instability which you can notice in complex adaptive systems. Mm. But thinking about it with with human clothes on, if you like. Yeah, yeah, no, no, brilliant. And uh, and I guess his point about there's no such thing as this system is this kind of reification of this kind of yeah. thing that exists that you can play with, as opposed to recognizing that, that what is there is a kind of reflexive interaction of people that, yeah. uh, that may or may not form boundaries, you know, may or may yes. not stabilise. So exactly. And, and I suppose it was, it was to pay attention to what human beings are doing with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than, 
rather than taking what's known in organizational studies as an entity based view of organizations yeah. no, brilliant. where we produce something called a system and we can act on the system yes. which is comprised of parts yes so yes. so the idea does go back to kant yes but i th I, I would think that um ralph would um be the first to admit that he wasn't the first to notice this idea of yeah. systemic thinking covering over what human beings might do, might be doing yeah so yeah. Nor norbert elias made the same point he, yeah. he argued that to yeah. think in terms of systems for what human beings are doing is um importing an analogy from biology which is appropriate to biology but not appropriate to sociology yeah yeah, yeah. no definitely i know that what that um, at least one of your other speakers wouldn't would have disagree with that very yes. strongly and yes. maybe that's where we'll have some interesting conversation yeah. in March yes yeah no no I can um yes I can imagine yeah uh, I yeah definitely so the the other thing so so moving on to you then you've obviously you know d d d lead the um the doctor of management program and and you know took in in, in my words took over from Ralph um yeah. and I I wonder what you feel um, how would you describe the contribution you you're making to to the field now? What do you what would you like to be to be known for? Uh, as a decent person who <laughs> <laughs> who's been kind to his mum. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. I, I think um, one of the things that I've done is to make alliances with the substantial but still minority critical tradition in organizational studies yeah. yeah so it's true that we're interested in social complexity but we're not the only ones yeah so that there are a variety of other schools so for example there are the, is the critical management studies school mm -hmm. who are not monolithic either but they draw more directly on the frankfurt school mm -hmm. Then there's a group calling some, themselves broadly process organization studies amongst whom you uh, count people like the late John Schotter, mm. Harry Tsukas. Uh, I don't know whether Barbara Simpson considers herself in that process school. And then there's the practice based school thinking about um, socio materiality and practices in organizations. So all of them I would, I would say would regard themselves as being interested in social complexity one way or another. Yeah. And some of them, for example, the process organizational studies school would think that to draw on the complexity sciences at all is being too um, objectivist. Mm. It's yeah. trying to make natural science mm. fit where it doesn't fit in social studies. Mm. Um, I suppose we're trying to have our cake and eat it. We're trying to maintain a foot in both camps and to refract the ideas from one discipline mm. in other disciplines. Yeah. But to make those alliances, so every year we have a, um, an annual conference and we've had a big, big hitter speaker every year for the past 10 years from those different traditions. Mm. Mm. And to uh, try and... Um, not exactly blend the ideas, but to borrow perhaps more widely from other traditions of thought who, yeah. who are still trying to write into the idea of social complexity. So that, yeah. so that would be a yeah. major no. contribution. No, and I think actually to try and keep um, practice-based learning and um, complexity theory going in the university, which these days seems quite hostile to it. Yeah. So I would say that, and this is a big generalization, which I'd stand by, universities um, are much happier converging than they are doing things differently these days. Mm. And in many ways, you could say that what we're doing on the Doctor of Management program isn't at all new. So it's an ancient Greek tradition to sit around deliberating about things. Mm. But actually, I have been asked by senior people in my organization, why do we have to do this differently? Why do we have to do it group based? Mm. Why can't we do it the way everybody else is running their doctoral programs, mm. pile it high and, and sell it cheap? Yeah. Mm. So it's even to maintain it in today's university, which values standardization over variety and difference i would say is an achievement yeah no definitely no it's um you know the action research program that peter reason ran at, at bath uni is no longer there you know yeah. they, as soon as he went and uh, judy marshall went you know it was yeah. 
you know, oh good, we can go back to, uh, you know, normal. It, 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 exactly that, yeah. yeah. No, well, that's very interesting. And I, I've myself become quite interested in the kind of um, how to move um, process uh, complexity, as I've called it, into, you know, connect with process philosophy. Yeah. And, and just the sort of blurring of we don't really have to have things connected by forces. You know, we, we have inter, inter penetrating weaving of, you know, relationships and and, you know, we are affected. You know, the idea of, of me as a as a person interacting with you is kind of both true and not true, you know, in the sense yes. that we impact each other, etc. So, yeah, I think it's a yeah. very, uh, fruit, you know, free yeah, uh, area. Yeah. Uh, and those are insights that the, the pragmatists shared, for example. So, yeah. um Dewey's theory of transaction says exactly that, that we're not billiard balls interacting, knocking against each other unchanged. Yes. We are changed by the interaction that we have with each other. So it's, it's mm -hmm. interpenetrating. Yeah. I suppose Hegel is the first person to have that insight. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, so, so brilliant. Well, that, I, I agree. I mean, actually to exist is, is quite something in uh, for so long in these, uh, in these university times. So, yeah. I, I had, I, I mean, my, my university, um, has ultimately been very supportive of what we do, but it has been a struggle when new people turn up into senior positions and you have to fight the fight again. Yes, yeah, yeah. Tell me why you do things in such an eccentric way is, is yeah. the kind of question you get asked. Yeah. Why can't you be like everybody else? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> So my my third and final question really is is to kind of look at the the field of complexity theory more generally. So, you know, we've got somebody who worked with Paul Cillier. Um, you know, we've got we've got the tradition that that Ralph um, established, and you've taken further Peter Allen, um, which I guess I fit into Peter and Prigogine's view, and then Dave yep. Byrne um, with his complex realism and and uh, his kind of meshing of qualitative and quantitative work. But if you look at the next generation, you know, um, in terms of what's needed next, where these ideas collectively are heading, um, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that, you know, what's needed for the future or what do you see emerging? Um, well, well, I suppose it links back to my last point about survival mode, really, and the kinds of links that I try to make within organisational studies. I guess all of us need to keep doing that because there are, there are still huge social problems. Mm. And sometimes when I listen to environmentalists speak, and I would say this is from being an interested amateur rather than having mm. uh, followed these things very professionally. But sometimes, for example, when I listen to environmentalists speak, they sound as though they're trying to pursue things in quite an, a systemic and instrumental way mm. without taking into account social complexity, for mm. example. Mm. Uh, I, I understand why you might want targets on carbon emissions and things, but not everybody, not everything succumbs to a, is is well framed by a target, for example. No. no. And if and if you're serious about the other social problems mm. that you face, mm. so we're immediately caught up with the pandemic, and I'm very interested in the kind of complex modelling that people have been doing around there, which was mm. fantastically helpful, but also complex social behaviour that has resulted. Mm. Yeah. as a consequence of our trying to adapt and respond to what's going on. Yeah. Uh, um, but sitting behind that disaster is the, is the bigger disaster of environmentalism. Well, I suppose yeah. the two are linked, aren't we? We, yeah. we have a pandemic because there's an environmental yeah. crisis. Yeah. 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 So to keep looking at the social aspects of this, the complex social aspects of this, and to make links with the next generation of people to complexify their thinking about yeah. what they care about. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I, I um, and and of course the economists. You know that the the biggest thing that happened to the global economy was, you know, was a bat. You know, in uh, in China, you know, was a pangolin yeah. in China. But yeah. the the sort of the 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 post, you know, to 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 post disciplinary systemic thinking and yeah. um, and for economists because you know it, the eco economy and the environment are not really connected never mind you know the, the complexity of social responses you know that yeah. we, we seem to increasingly separate rather than connect and and here we have you know complex social environmental um political economic issues going on that that cannot be deconstructed um yeah Yes. I, I think it's also um, important to hang on to, to the, the ethics of complexity as yes. well. So yeah. Um, yeah. I've been very disturbed by the way that 
uh, neoliberal thinkers, politicians, mobilize complexity to imply that there's nothing that can be done. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, um, Tony Blair's speech that we might as well resist globalization as resisting the, the, the following of summer by autumn. You know, there's nothing we can do, be done. Right. The social, the, the social is complex and all that we need to do is just work on ourselves rather than understanding globalization as a social process. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't directly amenable to our interventions, but that doesn't mean to say we can do nothing. Yeah we yeah. can think about what we're doing and make good sense of it yeah yeah and interestingly mike um carney i don't know whether you've heard the reef lectures yet but uh, I, I i've really, only heard bits and pieces of them yeah. yeah the first one is is about you know that that we need to have the an ethics for our economy you know like what is it for um it isn't just for for making money and growth you know what it, yeah. it, how how do you encapsulate this this complex social process with yeah. intention you know what what are the ethics and intentions so yeah. it's um yeah. it's it's definitely that's what you're saying I, I i've just been writing a chapter um for my latest book where I've, i'm comparing hayek mm. and norbert elias mm. who both thought mm. that the complexity of social life arises from what people are, myriads of people pursuing mm. their own intentions if you like yeah. Mm. But where with Norbert Elias, he thought that we could become wiser about the way we interact with each other yeah. if we pay attention to the effects it has on us. Mm. Whereas Hayek as an individualist seemed to give up on that. There's nothing we can do about the social. In fact, what the government needs to do is just get out of the way yeah. and just make the market work as though the market is some kind of natural force. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. there is a way of mobilizing complexity, I think, at, mm. in a kind of fatalistic way. Yeah. It's all very complex and there's nothing we can do and all we can do is improve ourselves as individuals. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think if you take a pragmatist line or a, a process sociology line, there are things that we can do. We can learn about what happens and patterns of inequality or patterns of injustice or yeah. the way that we habitually respond in groups. We can work on that. We can identify it and work on that and think yeah. about it um, and critically can... and ethically. Yeah. And we, and we can... You know um raise the issues i'm i'm kind of interested in um how with mba teaching you know there's very little taught about ethics yeah. um, i'm working with the university of cape town on their mba program and they they put they put ethics centrally yeah and and you know we we, we can you know invite people to find the best in themselves and think more broadly than themselves you know that yeah they're not exactly just that. consumers so i think that would um uh, that would be a lovely point to bring out, I think, in terms of your contribution. I mean, that that yeah. bringing back ethics into this seems like a really important yeah. thing for people to hear in March at this conference. So, I think I think what I, what we keep saying to our students is, yes, the world is complex. Yes, yeah. things don't work out exactly as you planned, but yeah. you're still responsible if you're in a yeah. position of authority. The, yeah. author the, the responsibility doesn't go away. No, and. And, you know, it is a complex system. Does it, 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 It's not random. It's not the future isn't random. The future is shaped by the past and by our exactly. intentions. Even exactly. Even determined yeah. by the past. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.